people who have gone into space than have lived underwater. It's a really important mission because nothing has been done quite like this. Fabian Cousteau is leading a 31-day mission in the world's only underwater laboratory, Aquarius. And we're delighted to advise him on some really exciting science that's going to take place. There are four specific areas where Northeastern is working. The first is looking at the health of our oceans. How can we understand what state our oceans are in? The second is how can we use that information to live sustainably? Benefit from the ocean but not damage it. The third is how do we rekindle that sense of excitement in the next generation? And the fourth is celebrating the role of women in science. I heard a statistic the other day that only 22% of the aquanauts that have lived underwater have been women, so I can't wait to spread the word and hopefully inspire young women to join marine science. By having Liz living underwater, we can really get all these really good 24-hour measurements with the coral and study these giant sponges for a very long period of time. And you can't do that out of other platforms. And so we really get a good idea of what's going on with the human ocean connection through this project in urban coastal sustainability. Northeastern is dedicated to what we call use-inspired research, research focused on solving real-world problems. Climate change is a real-world problem. So this gives us an opportunity to, to engage in something that we're committed to and also to contribute to the fundamental knowledge. Well, welcome once again to the Gordon Current Science and Technology Center. Uh, this is our Mission 31, where we are talking about research going on at the bottom of the ocean. Jacques Cousteau's grandson, Fabien Cousteau, has been living down there for about 25 days now. He's got six more days to go in his 31-day mission. And we have uh, many scientists from Northeastern University here today to talk about some of the science that they're doing in relation to a lot of the project that they are doing the research for underwater. And in just a few minutes, we at uh, 2.30, we'll, we, we will be talking to uh, some of the aquanauts that are underwater right now, including Fabian Cousteau, uh, Brian Helmuth, who was on uh, the video just then, and uh, Steve Director, the provost of Northeastern, who was also just on the video there and we're getting our our Google Hangout yes you can do a Google Hangout from the bottom of the ocean they do have Ethernet and Wi-Fi down there uh, on their Aquarius habitat um, but before we get we begin to give you some background of what's going on we have Isaac Westfield again who will be giving you some information about the overall mission 31 All right, um, welcome back to everybody that was here before and listened to me ramble on earlier. Uh, get some more of it now. Uh, so I'm going to give you kind of an overview of Mission 31, what it is, what's the point, why should we care, and what are they doing? Um, there'll be a number of videos in here, so you'll get to see some pretty cool stuff. Oh, where are we at here? Okay. All right, so... Here's all our sponsors that are helping make sure this happens. A um, lot of great folks helping out, including the Museum of Science. So what is Aquarius? Aquarius is the world's last remaining underwater research laboratory. There used to be various other locations around the world, but this is the only one left. It sits at about 63 feet off the Florida Keys at the bottom of the ocean. Um, the great thing about Aquarius is you can do what's called saturation diving. Normally when you're scuba diving, you're limited to a certain amount of time depending on how deep you go. At 60 feet, you've got a maximum of about 50 minutes. You can't do a lot in 50 minutes when you're trying to do a complex scientific experiment. So what they're doing is they're living at that depth. The thing that's the problem is, it's not so much when you're down there, it's when you come back up. That's when you run into problems when you're scuba diving. So if you just stay down there, no problems. So they're living in this large tube, essentially, at 63 feet, living at pressure. So they're going to be sitting there, and they'll, they'll go out for five to six, seven hours a day. So they can just sort of walk around on the bottom of the ocean and keep track of all the experiments. There we go. Uh, I'm having some trouble here. I don't, maybe I'm too far away. I'll stand over here. Yeah, no, it should um, work all right, so of course the person that's making all this possible is Fabien Cousteau, Jacques Cousteau's grandson. He's a big name in ocean conservation and it's very important to him. 
And uh, as you heard before, he's trying to kind of one-up his grand grandfather by going an extra day. Um, and that actually is a picture of him in Aquarius. This is, I think, his second or third time in Aquarius. Uh, so this is a picture of Aquarius. And you notice it looks, looks like something that fell at the bottom of the ocean has just been sitting there. Um, well, that's basically what it is. Um, so on the surface, you see there's all kinds of encrusting sponges and corals and things that live on it. So it's, it's an artificial reef in itself. So it's actually building habitat for organisms. So this is, uh, I believe it's Liz in her first time in one of the helmets, taking her dive at Aquarius. Seeing Aquarius for the first time today was just magical. It was awesome to be feeling like an astronaut with the hard hat and everything else and just gliding down to the inner space station. And just looking around, I mean, there's, there's divers, they're getting the, the habitat ready. The habitat itself has become a living reef. So you've got coral and crustacean around it and tucked away in different parts and underneath the habitat, you've got lots of life around it. You know, it's out of this world and it's underwater and it, and there's, uh, it was magical, just really magical. Of course, all these things are in preparation for the big splashdown for Mission 31. We have another week to go before splashdown where we're going to be doing this every day for 31 days. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, so now you get a kind of an idea of how it all starts. Um, having some trouble. There we go. So this is during training. Uh, one thing you have to do when you're learning to dive is you have to be able to flood your mask and then drain it again. Well, it's a little different with a helmet. So this is her first time ever doing this. <laughs> so you see on the right side, the water's starting to fill in. force more air in there and it evacu evacuates all the water. Here we're going to see a, a video tour of, of the inside of Aquarius, I believe. Yeah. Today our boat headed out to the Aquarius Reef Base where the aquanauts will live, work, eat and sleep on the ocean floor for the next seven days. I'm a technology and oceans reporter and when I heard Aquarius was having its last scheduled mission I had to check it out for myself. My dive buddies were Mark Ostrich from One World One Ocean and Fabian Cousteau, the grandson of Jacques Cousteau. Fabian Cousteau is visiting Aquarius because his grandfather created the first underwater habitats 50 years ago. This is how they get inside. We were the first to visit the aquanauts and get a tour of the habitat as they moved into the new home. What is all this stuff? It's moving into 20,000 millimeters under the sea. One of the coolest pieces of real estate on the planet. We just got here a few minutes ago, and now we're moving in. You can see there's lots of action in the bunk room. A lot going on. There's a lot of pots coming down right now, all the electronics, and uh, I'm just eating a cracker. Uh, there's actually wireless internet access, so we're underwater, and there's wireless internet access. You can surf the web. We also got a, a million dollar view out of this uh, prime piece of real estate. We eat our meals here. This is a, a wonderful place to, to take in the, the predator show at night. Um, but most of the time we're actually outside. That's, that's the whole purpose of this uh, underwater space station is not to be in it, but to be out on the reef doing our experiments and studying this wonderful coral reef. This is my third experience here. I hope not my last. It's like a dream come true. 
it's what little kids dream about. And here we are, we can be little kids realizing our dreams. It was a really unique experience interviewing Sylvia Earle in Aquarius. She's lived underwater nine times before this, and I think that makes her the most experienced of any aquanaut around. Treatment for the fins. These are all valves to control the air and the habitat. These are all switches, almost like a breaker in your house. You do not want to hit that red button right there. Not, don't want to hit that button. I've right never here, found out what that red button is. That's actually the live webcam going out to the internet. Over here, we have our galley, our sink, we got hot water, microwave. Somebody, uh, somebody was making mac and cheese there. So up here we have uh, a lot of food. Yummy M&M's. That's not a plug for M&M's, but they are very, very good. We've, we've learned, you know, how to take showers and keep the habitat nice and dry, where to hang our towels, you know, equinaut etiquette. <laughs> These doors all have O-ring seals. These are all sealing surfaces. We actually close these doors and pressurize the inside cabin here to a different pressure. This is where we'll decompress at the end of the mission. We'll bring the inside pressure here all the way up to sea level with the door shut, and then we'll do a very short dive to the surface. Brian, we're gonna have to wrap it up. All right, one minute. The aquanauts can be down there for seven days straight because they're saturating, but since we're just scuba divers, we've only got an hour in the lab. And for that hour you have, it goes by so quick. Before you know it, it's just time to leave. Sylvia and the other aquanauts were gracious hosts, and I look forward to visiting them again. Okay, hey, there's a good tour. I, I imagine we'll get another one here pretty soon this afternoon. Uh, okay, so what science is going on down at Aquarius? Well, there's five major themes. We've got corals and environmental stress, environmental contaminant exposure, sponge feeding activity and energy budget, health of the reef zooplankton, and sponge DNA for the ocean genome legacy. So these are a very wide range of different uh, subjects that you can do, that you can study down on the bottom of the ocean. And some of this you can do normal scuba diving, but not to the extent that they're able to do. I've, I've heard statistics where you can do 60 days worth of science in a week of time at Aquarius. So corals and stress. This is what I talked about a little earlier. So one of the groups, Mark Patterson, in fact, you saw him in that video. Uh, Mark Patterson and his student are looking at how do the corals down there respond to the different stresses in the environment, whether it's temperature, sediment, predation, uh, ocean acidification, all these different things. And they're going to do that by measuring the internal structure of the corals themselves. So they've got these tiny little probes that they're sticking down in the mouth of the corals. And here we go. So this is the, the probe up here in the top sticking into the coral, and then they've got this machine down here that actually does the measurement. Um, so it's 25 microns thick, so half the width of a human hair. Uh, and then with that, you can use the data and make predictions on how the corals will respond to the various climate change that's predicted in the future. Uh, the next topic is environmental contamination on the reef. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that comes out of Florida. You've got cities, so pollution gets into the water system and it all flows out onto the reef. So what they're going to do is they're going to look at the uptake of various toxins and pollution in the coral. Or not necessarily the coral, but in the organisms there. And the way they're going to do that is they've got these what they call passive samplers. So they've got these pieces of plastic that are attached to these ropes and they just kind of floating around in the water and they, they pull in the toxins from the water and the pollution at about the same rate in the same way that the organisms do. So what they do is every so many days they'll go out, the, the Aquarius aquanauts will go out and they'll collect a piece of the plastic and they'll take it back into, the, into, this, um, into Aquarius and they'll wrap it in foil and then they'll send it back to the surface and they'll analyze the toxins that are in the plastic. And depending on how much they find at different times, they can calculate the rate that it's being taken up by the organisms in the reef. So here you can see they've got this little buoy that 
floats up, and then they've got the plastic strips. The next one, sponge bioenergetics. So sponges are very important on the reef. Um, these giant barrel sponges here, they basically take all of the water on the reef and they pump it through their bodies every couple of days. So they're, they're filtering the entire reef every so many days. And what you can see in this picture right here is the, uh, the diver has injected what's called fluorescein dye into the outside around the, the sponge. And then the sponge sucks it in and then pumps it back out through the middle. So you can calculate how quickly it's pumping the water through. And what they're specifically looking at is, um, is that going to start? Um, don't should. start that yet. Don't start um, what they're going to do is they're, there's this, uh, they're working on the theory that the different cells from the sponge are actually providing food to the rest of the reef because they recycle their cellular structure very rapidly. So all of this cellular material is floating around in the reef and so like the corals and the fish and the zooplankton, they're, they're eating the different sponge cells. So they're looking at how much they support the reef in that respect. So they might talk about that here. Coral reefs are the rainforests of the sea. This ecosystem may be our best hope for the cure for cancer, heart disease, and a host of other human ailments. We may find these drugs on the reef. So today what we're doing is we're, we're making some measurements from the day boat using scuba diving. We're taking a water quality instrument called an XO2. And this is a really cool device that's got uh, all manner of probes that can measure dissolved oxygen and pH and the temperature and the salinity of the water. And one thing we're going to try today for the first time is, is using it as a probe to measure the metabolism of some barrel sponges on the reef. The sponges are the, the oldest multicellular life on the planet. All the water on the coral reef passes through the body of a sponge every 24 to 48 hours. The sponge communities are really important on the reef. They're a, a really valuable uh, filter. As anybody who has a home pool knows, your pool will go green if you don't have a good filter cleaning the water in it. Sponges play a really important role in that those hard bottoms of the spurs are really where the sponges and the corals want to take hold. Sponges really like to have a, a nice hard substrate to anchor onto. So we're going to be looking at some of those areas and try to see if we can get a sense of, of what their preferred substrate environments are. Maybe we can find new medicines out there, new ways to treat uh, diseases, even new engineering systems for, for filtering or help develop reef systems in other places. So it really makes it exciting. It would be a tragedy if we you know, lost the cure for cancer because we lost the components of the ecosystem. So that's why it's important to understand the functioning of the entire ecosystem and protect it because our well-being is at stake as a species. Okay, so the next topic, zooplankton health. Um, how is this very small organism that's kind of the crux of the ocean responding to climate change? What's global warming doing to them? What's ocean acidification doing to them? Right place at the right so what they're going to do is they've got these plankton nets that they stick out and they've got, they kind of float upside down and Sorry, right. during the day and at night these plankton will get inside these nets and they kind of swim around they can't get out and they get trapped in the little cups at the top. So they'll collect these on a daily basis and then they can take those plankton back and look at them under the microscope and analyze them and figure out what's going on. Um, and then here you've got some some video of Sylvia Earle from a previous Aquarius mission looking at uh, everything on the, on the window. So you can get an idea of how important they are to the reef. They're a major food source for a lot of the other organisms. So fish, for example. And here we have a, a video about the Ocean Genome Legacy Project at Northeastern. Audio. Data to help us better understand our environment. 
and even cure disease. Researchers here at Northeastern University are solving global challenges in health security and sustainability, with particular emphasis on urban coastal sustainability. Our marine science faculty and students are pursuing knowledge from the depths of the ocean to the coasts of continents and in our state-of-the-art labs. Part of their journey is now rooted in an amazing partnership between Northeastern and Ocean Genome Legacy, a public biorepository of DNA samples from ocean life. A physical database of the world's rarest, strangest, and most remarkable ocean creatures that's now right here at Northeastern in our Marine Science Center. This biorepository provides an unprecedented wealth of knowledge for our research faculty, students, and scientists around the globe. An infinite world of discovery is waiting below the ocean's surface. And thanks to OGL, that world is now accessible in our labs. So you heard Mark Patterson talk earlier about finding the cure for cancer on the coral reefs. Well, that's kind of along the lines of what OGL is looking at. Their, their goal is to collect the DNA of the different organisms in the ocean so we don't lose them. And by keeping this bank of information, the bi this biological information, we'll have access to this far into the future if something terrible does happen and we happen to lose those species in the ocean, for example. So uh, as soon as I stop jabbering at you, um, we're going to have the folks from down in Aquarius that are there right now that are going to speak with you. And I think, um, uh, what was it? Uh, mm, We've got Brian Helmuth and Steve Director are down there as well right now. They did a surface yes. dive down. Yep. They're just sitting down at the table. That's what I've been doing back here as we've been finding out when they're getting there and where so, they are. So we've got six people living in Aquarius, and then there's a couple dozen people working the surface crew. So they'll make daily dives down for an hour or so. So a couple of the folks that you'll see on the video here are part of the surface crew. Well, thank you, Isaac, for that intro. And uh, they're still getting set up. So we were watching. That's what we were kind of looking back here. We've got a, our Google Hangout all set up. And uh, we've got, so a couple people we're going to be talking to coming up now. We've got, uh, we'll show you, uh, this is just the general live feed that anyone can get at any time. There's a Mission 31 website and the Aquarius website that's run by Florida International University where you can go and basically watch them at any time while they're in their kind of main living space galley kitchen area down there. And that's where we'll be talking to them from. Um, but you can actually follow other things that are going on down there. There's some cameras outside looking in. Uh, we'll be talking to Fabian Cousteau. We'll be talking to uh, Brian Helmuth and also Steve Director, the Provost of Northeastern. And they're just getting ready. We were watching them swim down on the outer camera down there. And we've also got Liz McGee, who is down the, the bottom there. And she's going to be, she's swimming around outside right now. And we'll be able to get, she has a video camera, um, her perspective looking out. So not her face, but what she's seeing. And she's going to swim around and uh, do a couple things, maybe show us a barrel sponge and some other things. And we'll go to her as well as we're chatting with, um, with the other aquanauts who are down there. Yeah. So they're still getting ready right now. And they have to dry off. They're sitting down. They're switching seats. But we can take a look at what Liz is doing right now. So there's one of the, um, the zooplankton, the zooplankton nets that we have, one of those back there on the back table and that we've been talking about. Uh, they set them up mostly to collect them for during the night because that's when the zooplankton, if you saw in that last video, um, they were looking out the nightscape. That was all the zooplankton that was out there. So that's what they're setting these up. And then in the mornings, they'll go out and they'll collect them. And so, <laughs> Okay, we've got them. Is this the chat? Okay. Um, so in the morning, they'll, they'll collect all the containers that are up in the top there and send them up topside for people to see what kind of zooplankton they have up in there and, and uh, study that zooplankton.
We're just wondering who else is here. Uh, some other people that could be out there. So Grace Young, um, as her name actually implies, uh, she just graduated MIT. Um, and she and Liz are uh, the two women that are down there right now. So Grace might be out there. Oh, I think that's Francis. So Francis is um, also with Northeastern. He's doing, he's staying up topside, um, but he helped us put together a lot of this event today. Um, so we're excited about that. And it uh, looks like he's down there. He should be down there. Okay, so now we're going to switch to the actual feed. Can you guys hear me right now? Give a wave or something. Hey, David. Yeah. Oh, hi. So we've got Susan, Susan on mic and David on video, which is probably awkward. Uh, yeah, we're seeing David. And I'll, I'll channel Susan. Can you guys hear us okay? Uh, yeah, we can hear you pretty well. You guys hear okay? Right, to start. Hey, David, can you lip sync when Susan's talking? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, we're good to go. I don't know. Oh, there I am. Hey, nice. <laughs> hey, Susan. Oh. So we've just gone through a whole intro about what's going on down there. We went through all the different types of science going on. Um, people have been really excited. We've had a whole bunch of people here throughout the day. Um, but I guess we'll start off, if anyone in the audience has any questions, we can alternate between any questions I have and anyone here have anything. Yes, we have a young gentleman here. We're going to get his question. He wants to know, oh, how do you keep the air inside of the habitat? I'm oh, sorry, could you please repeat that? How do you keep the air inside of the habitat? We, uh, we keep blowing really hard. <laughs> um, it's, that's a good question. We get that, that question a lot. Basically, imagine a cup turning it upside down and plunging it into water there's still air trapped inside, and as you go down, the air gets denser and denser because of the, of the uh, pressure. The way we keep air, uh, water from coming inside the habitat is the air pressure inside the habitat is the same as the water pressure outside the habitat, so almost three atmospheres or three times what you all are breathing right now. This is probably why we sound a little funny, why we probably can't whistle down here, and why it's a little harder to breathe. Hey, Susan, before you ask, can we do some introductions here before you go on? Yes, please. Sorry, we had already introduced you before you got there, but you can oh, do yeah. your own introductions, okay. please. Right. So, um, I think we have, oops, do we have them still? Oh, they're, they're off on the side. I think they're hiding. But, uh, yeah, the divers are coming up. Yeah, we have two of our aquadots um, who we wanted to introduce you to because I think you'll be seeing part of what they're seeing from the helmet cams in a minute here. Um, but we're having a hard time getting them off the reef. Yeah, here they come. They're having too much fun on the reef doing science. <laughs> so uh, I'm seeing, I think that is Liz. Come here. No, that's Grace. That's, Grace. that's definitely Grace. That's Grace. <laughs> she had the ballerina moves yeah. going on. There we go. She might have just enough umbilical to make it up here. Oh, there we go. You can see her bubbles. There she is. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. Hi, Grace. Grace Young. Hi, Grace. I can see that. <laughs> she was pointing in her hair as it had fallen down <laughs> in the head, like, on the cam. And I think we have Liz out there, too, right? Uh, Liz is probably out there. Did you want to Did call Liz over? It? Yeah, we were actually looking through Liz's oh. eyes. Before. Oh, there she there is. There she is. Hey, Liz. Hi, Liz. Hey. And right behind them, you can see some spotted eagle rays flying by. For the first time, for 26 days now, they've been flying around here, and it's unheard of. No one's ever heard of eagle rays sticking around. So we're really privileged to have Liz Grace and the eagle rays. <laughs> They're doing research on you. Uh, yeah, yeah, on, on, on us, right. It feels uh, like we've had some up-close encounters with them from the surface as well. They're down more and more curious and getting closer and closer. It's really pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, no, Northeastern University has partnered with us, uh, and uh, Grace is a graduate of MIT, 
And they've been working very hard. I think we should, we should say we all have been working really hard, top side and below, uh, on all sorts of things, including plankton and sponges. But the experts are right across from me, right here. So maybe <laughs> they can fill you in on that. Yeah, actually, I mean, I you had a chance to come up to Northeastern a couple of months ago. We're very grateful for that for the verbal lecture. Um, and you have a chance to hear what we had going on with urban coastal sustainability. Yeah. I mean, you spent a lot of time about as immersed in a natural environment that's impacted by humans as it's possible to get. So I'm kind of curious to hear you know, what you think you had a, even a moment to reflect on anymore. Well, it, it's, a, it's a thrill to be down here. And actually, yeah. you know, people always ask, well, are, are you ready to get out of there? Uh, you know, 26 days have been so long. The whole time I'm thinking, oh, my God, we only have six days left. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's when the panic sets in because all the work that – uh, our team and your team together are doing, uh, that if the FIU students are doing and everything else, has culminated in gathering so much more data down here than one can do from the surface. And yet, this is such a unique opportunity to do so, that now we're realizing that we need to do so much more. Yeah. But the, uh, what we've seen is, besides the, the uh, luxury of time and the unbelievable uh, access to this oceanic frontier uh, as long as we want to go out there, uh, the, the reef is a very dynamic place. It is changing all the time but, uh, between uh, climate change and pollution issues as well as just natural ways. Uh, it, it's amazing to see that there's so many sponges down here, which is kind of the crux of some of the things that, that we're all doing here. And uh, the, the sponge population seems to be very healthy. Yeah. Well, we hope to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. I just want, want to say that it's really terrific that we're able to watch and with you on this. The uh, North Kingston is committed to doing work on urban coastal sustainability. It's a real problem that we have. Now, coral reefs are one of our precious resources. And unfortunately, they're not the most healthy. Right. The whole, the whole ecosystem. So this kind of work not only allows us to continue our research, it allows us to get the story out. Of the well, and, and we want to make sure that everyone knows that when we say reefs, it's not always tropical waters. You have reefs in temperate and cold water zones as well. And so what is happening here is indicative. Of, I'm sorry I keep looking out the window, but I see an eagle <laughs> ray right there. Uh, it's indicative of what's happening around the world with with uh, changing pH or acidification, climate-related uh, issue, obviously, as well as some of the pollution issues, and, and you all are, of course, gathering some of that data as well. Right. The other thing I would like to point out, because one of the things that we as an academic institution are most interested in, in addition to the science, is increasing the number of people that go into science and engineering, into the so-called STEM, STEM field, and it's particularly in, in, uh, encouraging young women to get involved in this. And what's what's amazing to me is just the number of, of women that are involved in this particular mission, students uh, and other people. It's just, it's a great field for people to get involved in. Well, you know, for what I, I had for goal for Mission 31 is, for, of course, to make it a communal platform to engage people around the world to highlight how amazing STEM education is, how, how uh, careers in different aspects of STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, arts, um, and that it's all-encompassing. It, it's not male or female. It's not a particular demographic. As a matter of fact, it's so much more accessible to everyone nowadays that we, we want to use the lens of adventure to highlight STEM education and, and just the careers around things like being aquanauts, like being green biologists, uh, robotics engineers. Uh, you know, you name it. Uh, you could be uh, oh, no, something are, out there. Uh, Is that a person? Are very important. Someone outside uh, there who just found uh, someone so there? Yeah. So there are a few. Uh, there are a couple of people outside. There are escort divers. They're from the uh, the Navy and uh, the Aquarius Reef Base. So for the six of us down here, we have about 36 people at the reef base and up above on a, on a ship to make sure that everything is going okay and that we're supplied well and uh, they're, uh, they're just, uh, you know, it's like NASA. It's just like a, a, a NASA launch. You have a whole support staff to make sure that that NASA launch and the International Space Station are working. This is the inner space station.
Just going back to something, Fabi, you said a minute ago. I mean, one thing that we found, we, we have a surface team that's been diving uh, to support the bottom team, and we've been having a lot of fun with it. And, and I think um, a couple of people that, that we've interacted with have been surprised at how much fun we're having doing science. I mean, it is it is hard work, these guys will tell you. I mean, to, to get down here, we had to pull ourselves hand over fist because the current was running so much. We call oil worth diving. Yep. <laughs> and we had a couple days like that where we're having, you know, $10,000 instruments and crawling along the bottom. But, you know, we get up and we were really jazzed about the science we're doing and being out in the water and being part of this. I mean, it's it's just a lot of fun doing it. Well, and, and one of your coworkers, Dr. Patterson, is out there right now with the ladies in the hard hats. And what he showed me the other day with some of your graduate students mm -hmm. is this, this cutting-edge technology that you all are using to use a 100 nanometer probe, which yeah. is the size of a human hair, right? a super fine, very fragile, very expensive piece of equipment, cutting-edge technology, to probe into a coral polyp to really get a good, accurate reading of how healthy that so, coral is. Yeah, so what it really demonstrates is, is how it's a disciplinary this kind of work is. It's yeah. not just biologists, or it's not just engineers, it's not just scientists. It really is a combination of people because we're solving these real-world problems for boys that, that it's a disciplinary. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and then we have to tell about it. We have and to talk about it. That in your brain now. You know, and, well, that's the, you know, my grandfather used to say, if one person has the chance to lead an extraordinary life, he or she has no right to keep it for themselves. Right. And that's just the essence of storytelling. And through the advent of devices like this, you know, we, we're able now to put the, that power in the hands of the public. You can communicate with anyone, all 7 billion people in the world now, through the advent of social media and mobile technology. So for us, it's amazing to be able to do that down below. Yeah. But for all the people out there, if they have a concern, a desire, whatever, now you can actually, in this generation and beyond, you can now talk to anyone you want and really make things happen, make change happen. I've been watching, we've been using the, we've been using the live stream to kind of, to look in there. And it seems like you guys really just sit around and eat a lot, though. So, <laughs> I was going to say, I'm having a hard time not eating. Yeah, I, I wonder if it, I guess it's because you're always just showing the galley in there. Well, but, between uh, uh, all the activities of diving, I mean, we do dives anywhere from six to ten hours a day. Uh, and the fact that we walk by the food every time we go back and forth in this little school bus. Uh, you know, the M&Ms are probably the most delicious thing down here because it's one of the only things we still taste. <laughs> so, uh, so, Steve, this is your first trip down to Aquarius, is that true? It's my first trip down to Aquarius. So, what impressed you the most, this uh, kind of popping up down there? Well, I mean, the amazing thing about Aquarius is, of course, it allows people to stay down for very long periods of time. Uh, normal diving, you dive for 40 or 50 minutes, and you have to go up to the surface and wait an hour or so and then go back down. But these, by staying down here under pressure, they can dive many times, as you said, six, eight, ten times a day. Uh, they don't have to decompress until the very end. They really have the time to work on, on the science. But the other thing you may not appreciate from from your vantage point is, is how small this habitat really is. <laughs> uh, we're sitting in, in one of two rooms here, and this room is probably 10 or 15 feet long and maybe five or six feet wide, and there is another room like this with six bunk beds in it, and that's it. Uh, so the, I, I'm not staying down here for 31 days as, as Fabian is, but I'm sure you get to know the people that you're living with really well. <laughs> yeah, you, you, de you definitely get to be close uh, to people. Let's put it this way. Uh, the people that are down here now are my five newest best friends. And uh, we've shared uh, just about everything together, uh, whether we like it or not, because of the, the enclosed environment. And it's just like astronauts. I mean, you, you have to live in a, in a very cohesive uh, family down here for things to happen well. But to go back to your prior point, uh, at least the last uh, pair of scientists that was down here said that they were able to do six months of scientific research and data collection within 17 days. Uh, I'm, I'll wait for you to, to give me the, 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 the data on, on, on your end yeah. and see if that's the same for you, but I'm assuming it probably will be at least something to that magnitude. 
Absolutely. I mean, you get to give the time. But the other thing is, when we're using these really delicate instruments, but I mean, a lot of what we're doing is relying on cutting edge engineering. You don't want to jump out of a boat with that stuff all the time. I mean, we want to leave it down here. So it's fantastic. Is we'll bring it down. These guys will make a lot of measurements with it. We'll kind of move things around. So we have this. We have nightly calls. Where we're coordinating a lot of science, but none of that could happen without this kind of facility. So, so there are things we can only do here. And you, you, what you are missing is the whole infrastructure that's outside of this habitat. <laughs> yeah. right. All of the instrumentation, the, the cameras, and everything else that's actually going on that's really collecting all the work, uh, all the data, and working. And, and the students are having a great time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. we're, we're having a fantastic time. We always call them the top siders, <laughs> the, the non saturated, the unsaturated. Uh, and, but the, the point is that. It's not about staying inside the habitat. I mean, this is just our sleeping quarters and our communication station and where we have a bowl of soup or whatever. It's really about being able to be out there in the water column as long as possible because we have the luxury of time as saturation divers. So are you guys good to take a couple questions from our audience? Sure. <laughs> okay. I thought you're not supposed to do a thumbs up. We learned today you're not supposed to do thumbs up underwater. Yeah. Yeah, we can do the thumbs up. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. I just check it. I didn't want to. You know, if you do this, this is actually a bad sign in some languages, so I'm afraid to do that anymore. That's a good point. Do we have... Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. I have two questions. Um, one is how do you replenish your oxygen supplies? Um, how do we replenish our oxygen supply? Well, so Aquarius has two ways. Number one, I'm sorry, I'm eating an M&M while we're speaking. Uh, number one, we have a, uh, a, a life support buoy at the surface that has a cable running down, and within that cable is uh, a, uh, an air supply that has a compressor attached on one end and pumps some of the air down here. Uh, we also have uh, three days of air supply down here at the habitat, so in case we're cut off from that buoy, we have plenty of air supply down here. And number two, that buoy also provides us electricity, which obviously we need for all the lights and power and, and everything else that we, uh, that we use, all the camera equipment and scientific equipment that's plugged into it, especially all our mobile devices. Uh, but um, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. I mean, on some level, it's a legacy uh, system, and on another level, it's very innovative. Okay, also, um, what has led you to think that the cure for cancer might be in the reefs? I'm going to defer to you. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> because surprisingly, a lot of medicines have had the genesis with reef organisms. Um, prostaglandins, for example, started with gorgonians. Um, there are so many bioactive compounds. I mean, Think about a reef as this dynamic system where everybody's trying to eat everybody else. One of the ways that organisms try to prevent being eaten is they make really nasty chemicals. Some of those really nasty chemicals can do us uh, a lot of good. Um, and this actually might be a good time. I think you have Dan Distel there, don't you? Um, with Ocean Genome Legacy? Yes, he is. He um, spoke earlier. Yes, he is there. Excellent. He probably gave you some of the, the information on OGL as well, but um, these guys have been collecting for OGL. And that's one of the things we want to do is, is make sure we get some collections before these reefs disappear. I mean, we don't even know the rate at which they're we're yeah. them. We've, we've been taking uh, DNA samples from a lot of different species of sponges. We don't have the sponge book here because I believe the, the uh, Liz and Grace they're are taking it right with now. them. Yeah. And they are taking them right now. But uh, it's, uh, it's been pretty amazing. Do you uh, have any other things? Well, I mean, I think that, that you point out that sense of time urgency here. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, the coral reefs are disappearing, and the number of species that are uh, diminishing each day is increasing, and we need to capture that information as soon as possible. So with the OGL, we're able to store that information and store it. It's free frozen using liquid nitrogen, and it can be studied well into the future. So even though the, the reefs may not be here, the animals may not be here, we have the DNA uh, to study so, Dan, they've been doing a great job of collecting DNA for you guys. We tell, we've been hauling it up at night. They've been really getting a lot of stuff. Well, I have a question for Dan. Uh, can, uh, with, with OGL, uh, are, are we going to create a new Jurassic Park? Oh. <laughs> you know, Here, hold I'm, on. 
Okay, like, you know, I, I, I actually, there another question. Otherwise, I, I would like to, to point out that while we're down here in Florida, uh, okay. there he is. There's hey, a man right there. Yeah. No. Uh, we. We. It's. It's a possibility. You know, it's a possibility that uh, in the not too distant future, we're going to be able to bring back organisms that are extinct. Whether we want to or not is another question. So watch the movie, you know, <laughs> make your own decisions. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Steve, you have yeah, I just wanted to point out, we, we've been talking about the OGL, and I, I don't know if it was mentioned before we got on the air with you, but the, the OGL is actually a facility that's part of the Marine Science Center at Northeast University out in Nahant. And uh, I'm sure that for those that are very interested in, in seeing that, we could then set up tours for that. I highly recommend it. I, I, I got a chance to do this, uh, what was it, November yeah. of last yeah. year, and I was privileged enough to be invited by Northeastern to take a tour. And it, it is a wonderful center. And, of course, if you're thinking of going to school and studying marine biology or some related field, you might want to consider it. Yep, it's up in, uh, so it's up in Nahant, the Marine Science Center, so just up about maybe half hour from here. Beautiful, kind of out on its own peninsula there. It's a beautiful place to do research, and they go diving there all the time, even when it was, like, cold out. They still went diving. Okay, Can you hear me? Yeah. I just want to add one thing. I mean, it's, it's in a beautiful, isolated peninsula where we get the, the Gulf of Maine coming in, but we're really close to Boston. I mean, one of the, the hallmarks of the lab is that we're within sight of Boston, so... We have access to both risky environments, but probably more importantly, I mean, we're looking at human natural interactions as they happen on the shoreline. Um, and that's something we're, we're really trying to promote. And so by all means, please come out, but, but take a look at both sides of the fence. I could imagine that between FIU and Northeastern and, and other entities, all roads will lead to Aquarius. <laughs> <laughs> so, at least that's the, I, I would imagine as a, as a young student, that would be my dream, is to become yeah. an aquanaut, just like you've been, yeah. uh, just like we're having the privilege of being. Uh, who knows? Maybe uh, maybe that's going to be possible in the future. You know, definitely talk to your provost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have another question no, here. <laughs> so what happens to a human after they've stayed underwater for 31 days when they reach the surface? <laughs> what, I'm sorry, what, what happens to the human? What happens to humans? Well, they well the surface. Oh. Uh, usually celebration. decompression. <laughs> uh, right, so uh, as opposed to a recreational diver, a recreational diver will come down to about this level, 63 feet or so, do their work, and go back up after 45 minutes to an hour, depending on your depth and the amount of time you have on the cylinder and so on and so forth, your, your air consumption. And they come back up, they have a three-minute safety stop, go home, have a sandwich, go to bed. Uh, for us, it's quite the opposite, as you, as you heard earlier. We uh, are down here for the entire of the time, and after 24 hours, we become saturated with nitrogen at the partial pressure that it is down here. The bonus of that, of course, is it gives us the luxury of time down here. The negative, or the, the I guess the, the credit that we're accruing, is exactly the, uh, the answer to the question you're asking, which is, what does it take for us to get back to the surface after 31 days, or even after one or two days? And that basically is an 18 and a half hour decompression obligation. So for 18 and a half hours, we slowly go back up to the surface and decompress. Luckily for us, the Aquarius habitat is equipped as a hyperbaric chamber, so you can lock out that front door and slowly bring the pressure up inside the habitat so that you don't actually have to get wet and spend 18 and a half hours out there. Instead, we get to be really, relatively comfortable in here and bring uh, our bodies back up to that ambient pressure of one atmosphere at the surface. Once we're done with that decompression obligation, we quickly open that door, put on our, our scuba gear, and get out and reach the surface back to the land of sun. But maybe there's a little unknown though here, right? I mean, this is this is the first. This is the longest saturation that's, that's happened. The science here. I mean, there's yeah, there's it, a little bit known. There, there's been a lot of unknown here for a lot of reasons. I mean, this is the longest mission run at Aquarius by a long shot. I think 18 or 19 days is the longest prior to this. Symbolically, I'm doing one day longer than my grandfather 
just to mark the next pin step in ocean exploration, of course, get people's attention. And more importantly than that, just honor all those people uh, who have be, been aquanauts and ocean explorers and scientists in the past and really try and spawn on a new generation of people who want to do those things in the future. Because there's a lot left out there. We've explored less than 5% of our oceans. My gosh, that means there's so much crazy, awesome stuff in that alien world for all of you to go enjoy. There's another question out here. Yes. Hi, I was wondering if there are currently any collaborations in place between pharmaceutical companies and marine scientists. Sorry. Collaboration, are there any collaborations between uh, pharmaceutical companies and marine scientists? Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, I, I think you have Dan Distel there um, is, is probably the best able to, to speak to that, but, but absolutely. I mean, I think bioprospecting has, has been something that uh, pharmaceutical companies have been interested in for a long time. But, you know, the, the next evolution of that is, you know, we don't view the ocean as a, an ore mine. Um, you know, we're not prospecting. We're figuring out, you know, how do we, how do we extract benefit without doing harm to the environment. So I, I, that's been going on for a while, but I see it as, as kind of the next step of, of not just going and taking from the ocean to figure out how we live with it. Well, I can give you one quick example, uh, just because I was subject to it before Mission 31. There's a, uh, a biochem company out of France partnered with a Canadian company that, excuse me, it must be the pressure. Thank you. That, uh, oh, oh, oh. Okay, much better. Okay, so basically they extracted some um, chemicals out of fish that had basically antifreeze in their system, or a, a natural version of antifreeze in their system, synthesized it, have been using it for a, a baseline of products for beauty products because it's less stringent on FDA approval, but now are looking into being able to use that that extraction for uh, agents that help cure or help treat some of the uh, health ailments that are happening to human beings, especially with regard to cancer itself. Should I just oops, go ahead? I want to. I want to interrupt this question. Okay, so we have um, Robbie here, and he was really excited to be able to talk to Fabian today. So he's right, David. You're David. Move. There you go. Robbie. <laughs> Hold on, he's got he's got questions for you. Hold on, okay. Did you see any whales? Did you see any whales? Oh, oh Robbie, that's such a good question. Well, um, we're waiting for you to send us some whales because we've seen just about everything else down here. <laughs> Have you seen any whales yet? No. No. Oh, no. no. Oh my gosh. Well, they may be up in Boston right now. Yeah, the, uh, the, we're right near the Gulf Stream. We're, about, we're a couple of miles away from the Gulf Stream. But in here, in this area, we've seen a lot of animals, including eagle rays, the endangered goliath grouper, lots of fish species, some shark species. But we haven't seen whales yet. So we're really looking forward to maybe possibly seeing some sort of cetacean, whale or dolphin. But we never know. We but do have some strange creatures yeah. out the window here. We, we do have some mammals out here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we have the Northeastern team who's coming in to say hi here. <laughs> we managed to see them there. But there are there are many, many other other interesting fish and, and that you don't see often in Boston either. That you see that. There have been a lot of sharks. Hold yeah. on, we have, we have one more question. Robbie has one more question. Oh, Where absolutely, Robbie. Any Go for it. Shipwrecks? Any shipwrecks down there? Shipwrecks! Oh my gosh, they're so good. I've been looking for treasure since we first got here. Yeah. Because, you know, pirates used to come around here all the time. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, someone's hiding the pirate chests on me because I haven't found any yet. There are a couple near But there are, there are shipwrecks near here, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, do you want to say bye, Fabian? Bye, Fabian! <laughs> bye, Robbie! Okay, thank, thank you for the you. questions. Okay, so who who was down there? So was that Liz and Grace, and who else was there? No, we've got uh, Francis and Allie and Nick, and 
um, Sarah and Amanda, and then Mark is swimming back and forth pretty rapidly here. He's a fish in the water. Oh my God, that's um, lit it. That's all the Northeastern people. <laughs> they are, and Jessica sadly has to fly back tomorrow, so she's up in the boat. Um, <laughs> but we've all been diving three dives a day, uh, every day, in, in support of these guys. So oh, they're working hard. We're pretty yeah. tired. But. That's a question I have is, so after you dive for an hour and you have to go back to the surface, how long before you can dive again for another hour? Well, that, that's a good question. Usually it, it depends upon how, not only how long you were down, how deep you were down, but you have to wait until, how wait until the nitrogen that's been absorbed in your, in your muscles, uh, you know, leaves. And so it could be an hour, it could be 40 minutes. Uh, there's either tables or, or computers that tell you when it's safe to dive again. To give you an idea, I mean, we, we go out in the morning, we leave usually about 9 o'clock and get back about 6 o'clock in the evening. We do three 45-minute 40 dives, and we have to wait about an hour and a half in between each dive, and, and throughout that, we're cursing these guys the entire time. It's like, how could we just stay down there? And so, we have an infinite supply of air, which makes it even easier to stay down there. Yeah. Now, don't let them fool you just because they're dry. They're actually on a dive right now. Yeah. But just because they're dry doesn't mean they're not taking on tissue, uh, nitrogen in their tissues. Yeah. So we can only stay in here as nice as it is for an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then we have to leave. We have some extra bumps. If you'd like to yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. Do you want to come up and ask it? So then you can wave at them. What's your name? Emily. So this is Emily. Emily, do you want to wait? So the camera is over there. You want to Hi, wait? Emily. Okay. What's your question? Uh, how how many fish have you s seen now? Like different types or different, different types? Different types. Different types of fish. How oh, many different all types? Different types. Oh, wow. um, I'd say hundreds of different types. We've seen tens of thousands of fish. There, it, this is a, a marine protected area. And not only is, are we in the National Florida Keys Marine Sanctuary, we're also uh, within an area that's completely off limits and only for scientific research. So it's beautiful. It's a fireworks display of life. And despite the problems that we are seeing with the reefs, the biodiversity here is pretty amazing. And every night when we look out here while we're having our dinner, we see things like the Goliath grouper. I don't know if you've ever seen a Goliath grouper, but there's one on the other side of the habitat right now. It's endangered. It's enormous. It's six feet long and like 600 pounds. It's an enormous fish. Uh, we've seen sharks. We've seen uh, barracuda. As you can look outside the, the viewport, you see uh, yellowtail snapper and, uh, and our little uh, friends of Sergeant Major's. I mean, it's just amazing. Very cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, Emily. And Emily, uh, they're on the web all the time. If you want to watch uh, the webcam, there is one outside. You can watch the fish that they're seeing, too. Yeah, right on the website. Oh, they're back. <laughs> they may be telling us that it's time for us to start wrapping up and heading up, unfortunately. I think that's maybe. Okay, well, we'd like to thank you. I don't know if you can hear a round of applause, but if you guys want to give a round of applause. Uh, thank you for all your questions. Thank you. Oh, there's Liz. Oh, there's Liz. Can you see her beyond the M&M? Yes. There we are. <laughs> yes, we can. I don't think Liz comes in. Though. She just is out there. No, the she out there works the time. whole time. Yeah, we can't get her in. Yeah. It's hard to bring her back in. I would imagine so. She's been really excited about this. She's just having a great time out there. Okay, well, thank you all so much for taking the time to talk to us. We really appreciate all of this. And, uh, well, good luck with the rest of your science and with the rest of your dive. Thank you. Thank great. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Turn it back on our air conditioning. <laughs> oh, is that you turned it Thank, thank you all very much for joining us here. And we do have our table set up for the next hour or so. If you're interested in learning more about the specific research that Northeastern is doing down there, all the data they're getting, all the systems they're setting up is going to directly help the people that you see behind those tables there. So please feel free to do that. Otherwise, I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day here.